Uh, good afternoon from Buenos Aires to you all. I understand that from some of you it's good morning and from some others it's good evening. I would like to welcome in name of the <coughs> Ishma Knowledge Portal to all of you to this session and meet the editor. Uh, I would like to thank the ISQA and the ISQA Knowledge Portal for hosting this webinar and for all the great work they're doing to hold us together around the world. As I mentioned, the topic that will be covered is the, uh, it's getting your work published and we have the honor to, to be joined by Eric Schneider that I will introduce in a few minutes. Uh, I would like to keep uh, to let you know that Viviana Rodriguez and I are both the conveners of the research section of the ISCO Knowledge Portal, and I hope that from now on we have the chance to interact a little bit more and try to share knowledge on what's being done around the globe and re concerning research. Uh, please keep in mind that Eric will speak for maybe 40, 45 minutes and he can maybe be interrupted for questions in case you find it's needed uh, or they can be asked at the end of his presentation. If you go to the Q&A section, you can type your questions over there and at the end of the presentation, Viviana and I will read them aloud and we'll share, they will, we share it with the rest of the audience and Eric can answer them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very important for you to ask questions and to make this session as more inter as, as interactive as possible. That will be that will improve the experience of the of the webinar and will make it more more useful for you. Well, finally, I would like to introduce to introduce you to our speaker, which, as I mentioned, is uh, Eric Schneider, which is the Rand Distinguished Chair of in Healthcare Quality and Senior Scientist and Director of the Rand Boston. He's also prof assistant professor of the Division of General Medicine and Primary Care at the Bremen Women Hospital in Boston and at the Harvard Medical School and Harvard School of Public Health. And, and he's also, and that's his main role here, the editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Quality in Healthcare. So Eric, thanks so much for being here so late and please I move on on the presentation. Thank you very much. Great, right, thank you very much for that kind introduction, Ezekiel, and uh, thanks to Viviana as well for uh, organizing this and to all the staff at ISQA who have uh, been working, I know, very hard on the uh, ISQA Knowledge Portal. Uh, we're, I'm delighted to be here uh, today, tonight, or tomorrow, wherever, uh, whatever time zone you're in, to share a presentation that um, as I've been giving at the ISQA Annual Conference now over the past uh, couple of years, uh, and uh, did a version of in the Hong Kong meeting uh, last uh, October, September, October, <clears throat> and uh, uh, we'll uh, uh, address again uh, later this year at, uh, when ISQA convenes in Geneva. Uh, this is a topic of publishing your paper, and <clears throat> uh, what uh, goal of this uh, talk, if I could have the next slide, is to go over some of the basics of the international journal, and journals in general, uh, that uh, take peer-reviewed scientific publications uh, to uh, talk about some of the tips that uh, can be used to improve a research paper and uh, finally to um, answer your questions uh, uh, about uh, publishing, about papers. We probably will not uh, get into specific discussions around specific papers, uh, but uh, um, certainly any topics, general topics that may be of interest to the audience, we would uh, love to entertain questions. And at any time throughout the presentation, if you wish to chat uh, those questions, uh, either Viviana or Ezekiel will uh, alert me to those questions and, and I'll try to answer them. Uh, I'll start by describing uh, the mission of a journal in general, the International Journal, just one of uh, hundreds, literally, of journals. Uh, and essentially, <clears throat> what all editors are hoping to do is to find the best <clears throat> research work uh, and most current research work and try to report it in an objective and clear manner uh, to the public uh, and primarily to the audience of other scientists, uh, but not exclusively. <clears throat> Increasingly, journals are trying to get scientific messages <clears throat> uh, to uh, lay audiences to, in the, in the quality of care arena, we're frequently interested in getting our messages to a variety of audiences, uh, practicing clinicians, managers in healthcare systems, managers of, uh, of organizations that deliver healthcare. Uh, and policymakers. 
Uh, so uh, we um, uh, are not just uh, trying to reach a, a fairly narrow set of academics, but trying to reach a relatively broad audience with the messages we publish. Uh, <clears throat> I'll go to the next slide. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, distinguishes the International Journal for Quality Healthcare is that it's a specialty journal. And uh, we're a, a specialty uh, journal uh, as opposed to a general uh, medical journal, for example, or other type of disciplinary journal. Uh, we have a specific uh, set of areas uh, on which we focus. Uh, we try to go into depth in those specialty areas. And um, as I said previously, we're trying to reach a relatively specific audience um, across a broad number of categories, researchers, healthcare managers, clinical discipline, uh, uh, people from multiple clinical disciplines, uh, different professions, uh, including nursing, uh, physicians, and uh, 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 managers. Uh, and in reaching that audience, though, we're, we're really looking to reach people with an interest in the health in healthcare quality specifically. Uh, we also uh, look to try to create a sort of integrated content across the types of papers uh, that we publish, like any journal. So a, a cardiology journal is looking to publish across all of the special interest areas within cardiology, and likewise, uh, there are a number of specific areas within quality that we want to cover. Uh, whether that's patient safety or performance measurement, uh, policy related to uh, payment uh, that would improve quality. Uh, there are a variety of different types of papers, uh, but in a content area in general that we're trying to, uh, to uh, focus in on. Uh, let me move to the next slide to say a little bit more about uh, what that means. Quality of care, uh, as, as we understand it, really has to do with areas such as improvement. So we're very interested in studies uh, related to uh, efforts to improve the quality of care. And in fact, that's increasingly our focus uh, because uh, the problems of healthcare quality are generally well documented, although updates are necessary. Uh, and uh, more of the challenge uh, now is to how to take uh, interventions that work and apply them in, across a variety of settings and countries and uh, go from that to um, <clears throat> actual improvements in the quality of healthcare that's delivered access to care. Uh, we're also interested in organizational management because delivery organizations are, uh, and the way they're managed obviously has a profound influence on what's achievable in healthcare quality. Uh, the area of accreditation uh, certainly fits into our uh, interest area. Uh, we're very interested in uh, methods uh, and measurement uh, as uh, um, uh, topic areas. Uh, there's obviously a body of research around uh, how to measure the quality of care, how to measure changes in the quality of care, how to understand the uh, performance of performance measures themselves, and uh, we're very interested in that topic area. Um, methodologies uh, for assessing quality, for improving quality, uh, for uh, understanding the relationships among uh, features of delivery systems or providers or patients uh, or the population at large uh, are of interest. And then uh, safety uh, as a broad area is of great interest to us. Quality and safety are sometimes seen as synonymous. Sometimes people consider safety a subset of quality. Uh, others see safety more broadly. But uh, uh, these are the general areas in which we try to focus and integrate our content across the papers we publish. <clears throat> The um, uh, other uh, aspects of the journal that I think are uh, somewhat unique and may differentiate us from some of the other journals that publish in this area uh, are uh, our focus on, or interest, I should say, in government and private sector policy and how that how those policies affect quality. Uh, the, um, uh, some journals focus more exclusively on uh, interventions in uh, local healthcare delivery systems. We certainly publish those types of papers, but we're also interested in the policy issues, accreditation, uh, payment policy, uh, regulatory policy, law, uh, uh, and general policies that uh, countries and localities enact uh, that affect the quality of healthcare. Uh, and then our other uh, interest areas in international comparisons. Uh, uh, we. The journal comes out of a tradition over for the past 25 years almost now 
uh, of its existence, uh, trying to foster dialogue uh, from among people from different countries, uh, trying to increase the knowledge of how other healthcare systems uh, deliver care, how they improve quality, uh, how they uh, deal with safety issues, and uh, uh, to try to extract and, and uh, disseminate the lessons that can be learned uh, when uh, we observe how uh, uh, the participants in a healthcare system in a country like China or India or any one of the hundreds of countries in the world, uh, how they manage quality and how, it, it, uh, how their approach uh, could be uh, applied or lessons from their approach could be applied in the country we're uh, coming from. Uh, so we place a big premium actually on uh, trying to be inclusive of the quality uh, situation, uh, activities, and uh, health outcomes uh, across uh, countries. We'll go to the next slide. So uh, the next uh, topic I want to touch on, uh, given that sort of general overview of our interest areas, uh, the types of papers that we publish. <clears throat> and this is important because the, uh, the format of these papers uh, uh, helps uh, us to focus the messages that are coming from the journal, uh, uh, from the authors, really, who constitute the content of the journal, uh, and translating that into a form that a reader can pick up and easily and quickly understand uh, what type of paper they're reading, what that is going to contribute to their knowledge uh, as they uh, scan or read the paper. Uh, we focus on these six uh, types of papers. And if you go to the ISQA website, uh, the International Journal website, uh, there's an instructions for authors that actually walks through the format for each of these types of papers. And I'll talk a little bit about that here. Uh, the first type is the original research paper, and this is a typical scientific paper that uh, is uh, stating a research question, testing a hypothesis, marshalling data to try to answer that research question or test those hypotheses, um, trying to understand what the other influences are that might have produced the results of that uh, uh, research and then uh, discussing how that research fits into an ongoing body of research in that topic area. So these, this is the very standard research paper format. Uh, the, uh, uh, it has the typical form of a background methods, uh, 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 including analysis, results, and discussion. And I'll actually walk through, uh, as we talk about the various ways to improve a research paper, I'm going to focus primarily on original research papers. Uh, the second category is the literature review. Uh, this is the uh, place where we uh, will publish uh, systematic reviews. Uh, this is a fairly well-known format uh, uh, across journals, uh, but it's essentially taking, uh, using rigorous methods, the published evidence in a topic area and summarizing it in a way that uh, readers can understand what's known about it, a specific topic area. The third type is somewhat unique to our journal, although there are uh, variations on it in other journals, and that's quality and practice. And uh, because we're uh, interested in healthcare quality and in the application of quality uh, uh, practices, uh, original research uh, serves the needs of researchers uh, trying to understand and build a knowledge base. But uh, our other interest is in the application of, those, of that knowledge, of those principles, and those tools to try to ch affect change in the quality of care. And the quality and practice paper is a way to share that knowledge. Uh, we use a format, uh, which I'll also describe later, uh, that essentially elicits um, uh, a problem that uh, an organization or a, a group was trying to solve, uh, the uh, intervention that was selected to solve that problem, uh, a uh, set of measures that are used to try to assess whether improvement is occurring, uh, the lessons learned, or the, the results of that, uh, in the actual implementation, and then uh, uh, an evaluation, and I'll say that with a, a small e evaluation, the type of uh, data collection and analysis that can inform whether a change occurred why the change occurred and, and what can be done to improve the intervention. And then a discussion of the lessons learned from that. Uh, this is typically a quality improvement project that we're looking to, uh, to have described. 
Um, and then uh, the other category is the methodology paper. Uh, this is a, a relatively unusual category. It typically focuses on a specific tool or analytic method uh, that uh, has been used uh, or could be used or a proposed novel methodology and novel approach to um, uh, doing research in healthcare quality. We publish perspective papers. Those are uh, relatively brief, um, but longer than an editorial, uh, addressing a topic area of interest uh, broadly uh, that uh, has some novelty uh, or uh, regarding policy where there's sort of an unresolved question, a sort of point, uh, counterpoint uh, uh, debate where it's not clearly known what the best way forward is. We're very interested in perspective pieces. Perspective pieces also are an opportunity for an author to describe uh, some uh, area that's not well defined. Uh, uh, for example, uh, how to go about assessing care coordination. There's a lot of interest in that right now, perspective piece on that. Uh, how to assess uh, uh, home health care delivery. Uh, we've published perspective pieces in that area. And uh, obviously, there's a broad range of topics that could fall under the perspective. Uh, it typically doesn't include a systematic evidence review. It doesn't include uh, quantitative data. It's really meant to uh, clarify intellectually or conceptually uh, an area of quality. And then uh, we publish editorials, uh, some solicited, some unsolicited, which are essentially a chance to uh, reflect on a current policy issue or on a paper that's uh, been published in the journal recently. So I'll go to the next slide. Now, uh, this just gives you a sense uh, from uh, two recent years of the uh, submitted papers to the journal. Uh, the journal uh, uh, receives on, and overall has been receiving a larger and increasing number of papers, uh, 593 papers in 2011. And just to give you a feel for the uh, relative uh, breakdown of the submitted papers, uh, 440 of those, uh, fair, you know, the majority of them are research articles. Uh, we received quality and practice perspectives and letters. Uh, there were 81 of those in 2011. This, the literature review constituted 33, and the methodology papers, there were 32. Uh, overall, we publish um, uh, approximately 70 to 80 papers per year. Uh, so you can see there's something of a, of a high bar, actually, to uh, reach publication. Um, but this gives you a, a general feel for the types of and categories of papers that are being submitted. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, so I want to go now inside the black box and, and hopefully demystify some of what occurs uh, when an author has uh, performed a research project, uh, now written a draft paper uh, that they would like to submit, submits the paper to the journal, and the question is uh, always, well, what happens then? What happens next? And uh, uh, I'll describe uh, a process. This is a pretty typical process for any journal. Uh, and ours is a little varied from uh, what I've seen at some other journals. Essentially, that submission comes in. It's logged by a managing editor. And uh, all the papers are screened by me, uh, the editor-in-chief. And then. Um, uh, at that stage, uh, papers are, are uh, evaluated uh, for their fit with our general content area, uh, for uh, their uh, clarity, uh, the scientific soundness. There's a sort of initial screen uh, that, uh, to make sure that the paper is sufficient uh, and adequately formatted, accu accurately uh, or adequately described uh, and, and written so that it can be evaluated by others. Uh, at that stage, we do reject some papers. Uh, in fact, uh, probably about half the papers, if not a little bit more, uh, are actually screened out at that point, uh, either because they're maybe not a good fit with our topic area, or perhaps we've even published a paper in that same area recently, and we have to make a judgment about whether to publish again in that topic area. Uh, that papers that uh, don't that pass that initial screen are then passed on to uh, an associate or deputy editor. Uh, the deputy editors, there are five of them uh, for the journal, uh, and uh, uh, they are 
specialized in a variety of ways. Uh, we actually have uh, deputy editors from all over the, uh, the world. Uh, we try to represent the different areas uh, of the world among the five uh, editors. Uh, we have one in Europe, uh, uh, Ezekiel, who's in uh, South America, myself in the U.S., uh, Hugo Orsheim also in, in, uh, in Europe, Anthony Staines in Europe. Uh, and we're uh, interested, and, and Sunil, uh, Rosa Sunol, who's a, a Spanish-speaking uh, deputy editor from Spain, uh, we are um, often interested in expanding the deputy editor uh, 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 participation uh, of, of others. So if you have interest in uh, serving as a deputy editor, uh, we would encourage you to be in touch. Um, the deputy editors uh, uh, will screen the paper uh, for a, a second opinion, sort of, uh, to say, you know, is this something that, uh, given their special expertise, uh, they would like to see uh, move forward to peer review. Uh, most of the papers at that stage uh, are then moving on to the peer review process. And uh, I'll say a bit about um, uh, the peer review process in just a moment uh, because uh, that actually is really at the core of what a journal uh, does and what it contributes. Uh, if the uh, paper gets through the peer review process, it comes back to the associate uh, or deputy editor. Uh, there are comments uh, added at that stage uh, by the deputy editor. It's forwarded back to, to me as the editor-in-chief, and uh, we render a decision about uh, initially whether uh, to proceed forward with the paper or not. Now, in a larger journal, uh, there are additional steps that take place, uh, an editorial meeting with a large committee of editors uh, that would review a paper and the comments received. Um, statistical review is often a formal part of most uh, uh, other journals. We do uh, obtain ad hoc statistical review as needed, uh, so uh, it's, uh, the statistical review box is grayed out here because it's not a formal part of what we do, but it is uh, done on an ad hoc basis. Uh, at the initial, after the initial decision is rendered, we get back in touch with the authors. So let me uh, go to the next slide and talk about peer, the peer review process. What we're doing is that the editors are inviting experts in the area of that paper to assess the submitted article. Uh, the review is double blind. Uh, in our process, the reviewers and the authors uh, uh, don't know uh, who each other are. Uh, they don't know the identity. Uh, the reviewers uh, sometimes can guess. Sometimes they guess and they're incorrect. Uh, uh, and the authors may be able to guess who the reviewers are, but uh, I've actually seen it that uh, they guess and they're wrong. Uh, so uh, the, the, the blinding is meant to uh, take away the um, uh, influence of who, who's written the paper and really get the reviewer to focus on what the content of the paper is. Uh, typically, we request our advice specifically about uh, a variety of specific areas. The originality of the paper, its novelty regarding the science, the scientific accuracy of the paper, uh, the methods used, are they, uh, are they rigorous, are the statistical tests appropriate, are models that have been created appropriate, was it a qualitative research paper, was the qualitative methodologies uh, considered uh, uh, the most up-to-date and, uh, and, and the best. Uh, we focus uh, a lot of energy on the composition uh, of the paper. We ask uh, reviewers to tell us uh, how to clarify or improve papers. And, uh, and then we're finally very interested in the uh, reviewer's assessment of the interest of the paper to readership. Uh, and we believe our reviewers, since the reviewers are also authors and readers of the journal, uh, that they can give us a uh, fairly uh, accurate a sense of the likelihood that the paper will be of interest to the general readership. Uh, let's go to the next slide. <coughs> Uh, so uh, a couple of things, uh, and I could really probably say a, a, quite a bit more about the review process itself, and, uh, uh, but uh, among the things that we're uh, uh, keen on is that the uh, reviews reflect fairly and impartially uh, on the content and structure and messages of the paper. Uh, the editor uh, the deputy editor and ultimately the editor reread the paper and reread the and read the reviews, take those reviews into account. 
Uh, we typically try to obtain two peer reviews for every paper. It's not always possible, but uh, in, in some instances, we'll uh, get as many as three or even four uh, reviews if we're trying to really resolve uh, unresolved issues. Uh, reviewers sometimes will uh, give an opinion, uh, either in confidential comments to the editor or uh, sometimes in the uh, comments to the author, although we prefer they not do that, as to whether the paper should be published or not. We're not actually seeking that um, opinion directly. What we're interested in is uh, if the paper were published, uh, how, how could it be better, and if the paper has significant problems or not. It's the editor and not the reviewer who will ultimately make the decision about the paper. Actually, I should say the editorial team, because the deputy editors and the editor often work together to uh, render a decision. Uh, reviews can often be split. Uh, we find this not infrequently that one reviewer will give a very positive review, not have many suggestions, another reviewer a negative review with multiple suggestions. We actually also get reviews that are very positive where there's a lot of constructive uh, suggestions about how to improve the paper. That's actually the ideal from our perspective. Uh, and uh, it, it is often the case that the ultimate decision about uh, moving forward with a paper or not uh, it may not reflect uh, what the reviewer's recommendations were. Uh, the reviewers actually do make a formal recommendation as to whether we should think about uh, publication or not accepting the paper, uh, but we don't always accept that judgment. And if it's split, we wouldn't be able to because there's disagreement. Uh, the most uh, value uh, from the reviewers is not in their assessment of whether the paper should move forward or not, but really as um, uh, inform informants to our decision-making process about the paper. And um, in my own experience as an author, uh, reviewers often are able to have in supply insights that can lead to the improvement of a paper uh, and the way it's written, the way it's portrayed, uh, and even suggest analyses that we may not have thought of uh, previously. So we really see this as a partnership uh, between the reviewer and the author. Sometimes people consider it adversarial, but from our perspective, there's really a partnership here between the reviewer, the editor, and the author to try to make uh, a paper the best it can possibly be. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, so uh, I wanted to just reemphasize the what editors are looking for in a paper, uh, because that's often mysterious, I think, to authors. Uh, it's easy for us as authors to become really uh, you know, focused on our work and, and uh, estimated to be the greatest uh, piece. Um, but the editor has the role of trying to figure out how it fits into a much larger picture. And so what we're looking for in papers are uh, uh, messages or results specifically that are important that we think would change the way people are thinking about or practicing uh, related to healthcare quality. Novelty is important, uh, and novelty is complicated in this context of quality because uh, novelty uh, is uh, uh, frequently, uh, it, novel ideas or new ideas uh, uh, can be new to everyone, uh, or they can be the application of a method in a setting where it's never been used before, but that method may be well known in other countries. And so particularly for uh, the International Journal, uh, we sometimes uh, have to debate uh, whether uh, a method that uh, is already well established in the literature has been described as being effective. Uh, well, if that's applied in a setting where it's never been tried before, do we consider that novel or not? And those are judgments that uh, can sometimes be challenging for us. Uh, we're, of course, very interested in work that is scientifically rigorous and accurate. Uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about the methods that were used in a paper uh, and that includes the sampling, the uh, instruments that have been developed, whether the measures have been validated, uh, what the nature of the statistical analyses is, uh, the recruitment and data collection, uh, all of those uh, factors uh, play into our um, assessment of uh, whether the paper is scientifically accurate. And one of the challenges from an editor's perspective is if those aren't methods aren't described in sufficient detail for us to understand uh, the scientific accuracy, then that uh, sometimes uh, uh, can create a, a challenging situation for us and for the author and reviewers. We're also interested in papers that will have broad interest. So uh, it's not an unusual for a paper to come from a particular country, say the U.S., 
that, uh, let's say, deals with uh, a very um, topical policy issue that's relevant in the United States, um, uh, but in fact, uh, it's very specific to the United States and may not be of interest to people in other parts of the world. Uh, and so that uh, broad interest is an important uh, consideration when we read a paper. Uh, and then obviously we want work that's been done in an ethically uh, defensible manner. Uh, uh, journals in general take this very seriously. Uh, there's a whole set of guidelines from the International uh, Medical Journal Editors uh, 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 group uh, that's online that describes sort of what the expectations are from an ethical standpoint, and that typically means uh, assuring that uh, studies, scientific studies, have been reviewed by uh, human subjects uh, panels, making sure that uh, there was no exploitation of the people who participated, uh, either in the uh, conduct of the study or in the uh, writing of the study. Uh, so we take those missions very seriously. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. Uh, so now I want to turn to, uh, actually maybe I'll stop there and see if there are any questions, uh, Viviana, uh, that have come from the audience, uh, and if not, I'll move on to uh, the, the general uh, topic of improving the research paper. Not yet, Eric. So uh, this is the time where I, I beg you for questions that could be posted in the Q&A section. So, so far we got one question about if the webinar will be available after uh, after your presentation, and the answer is yes, it will be in maybe days to come. It will be posted in ISCO Knowledge as the previous webinars. So I encourage you to, to make questions. Uh, we'll be there to share with Eric. Please go okay. ahead, Eric. Thank you. Very good. And um, thanks for that question. So uh, let's move to the uh, topic of how to improve your research paper. So. Um, there are some very key fundamental uh, uh, areas that um, we look at actually at the, very, at the very first stage, the screening stage, uh, and so I want to share these with you because they, uh, they can really influence the likelihood that a paper can move forward. The first is to pose an original research question, and I've touched on this already that original in this context uh, may not mean uh, discovering something that's never been known anywhere in the world before, but uh, original in this context means uh, a new method, a new que a question that hasn't been asked before, or it has been asked before, but it's not been addressed in the way that uh, your paper or your study is going to address it, uh, or the application of a method or an approach or a tool in a, a setting where it's never been used before. All of those are uh, potentially original research questions. Uh, there are um, some questions in the area of healthcare quality that um, have been answered uh, pretty broadly and over many studies. So for example, uh, the you know, question of, well, what's the rate of uh, safety uh, adverse events in the hospital setting? That's a question that is, uh, you know, was quite original uh, 15 uh, years ago or 20 years ago uh, and has continued to have some originality for certain areas, contexts, countries, uh, local uh, situations, but we also have a very widely accumulated knowledge of the rate of adverse events in hospitals uh, throughout the globe in many countries. So uh, the research question, that research question is some, in some ways losing its originality, but the question about whether adverse events are occurring in the ambulatory setting and at what the rate uh, is in the ambulatory setting uh, or outside of the healthcare delivery system, uh, that, that actually still is an original question. So an original research question is, is very important to us. Uh, there are many papers that don't explicitly test the hypothesis, uh, but they're posed as original research. And the scientific method uh, is really our guide and so we do expect a research paper to test at least one hypothesis. Uh, there are other papers that try to test many hypotheses, uh, and that can be challenging because uh, for, for a number of uh, methodologic reasons, uh, but also just as a matter of, uh, of uh, communication uh, uh, of results. If you're testing 12 hypotheses, it's going to be very hard to uh, convey that to the reader in a, a clear way. Uh, not to mention the, the uh, 
issues related to multiple hypothesis testing and the statistical the interpretation of statistics in that context. The third issue is that um, tables and figures uh, should convey the findings, the key findings of your research without the narrative text. And this is probably one of the most useful tips I ever received as, a, as an author. Uh, if you um, uh, think carefully at the very outset about how you're going to portray the results, the, the quantitative results through tables and figures and the concepts in the paper, uh, and you think about structuring those in a way that a reader can look at just the tables and figures and understand most of what you've done and what you've found, uh, that's very powerful. Uh, so uh, one, of the, uh, one of the first places we often look when we're evaluating a paper is at the tables and figures to see if the messages are clear just from the, those tables and figures. Sometimes that includes uh, putting footnotes uh, in tables and figures that uh, describe exactly what the methodology was. For example, a table of logistic regression results, putting at the footnote what variables were included in the model. Um, uh, so uh, the best papers actually do a really good job of using tables and figures to very efficiently convey the results. Uh, the, the fifth point is to know and cite prior literature. This has a couple of implications. First, uh, it, it shows the editors and the readers that you're grounded in what's known already about the science of the particular research question that you've posed. Uh, the second practical implication is that that's often the place we're going to go looking uh, for potential reviewers of the paper. And uh, it's not uncommon uh, for a paper to come in, be sent to review, and for a reviewer to say, well, the paper didn't cite a number of other papers that have already been done in this area. Uh, and uh, that kind of raises questions about how well the author understood the prior literature. Uh, and um, uh, sometimes we discover that there's actually very limited novelty because prior publications have already addressed the question that's being asked. Uh, the sixth and maybe most important of all is that shorter papers are always better. Uh, not to extreme, but uh, we typically are looking for a research article to come in with a word count of less than 3,000 words. And we find that actually through the editing process as the paper gets shorter uh, and uh, is, uh, editorial feedback is applied, that the paper just communicates the results more effectively. Uh, and uh, prose editing is, a, is an art and a science. Uh, it, it often uh, ends up that a paper that starts out at 4,000 words can be made much clearer, much better by getting it down to about 3,000 words. So if the editor is asking for uh, a shorter paper, that's why. Uh, for the back, and then I'm going to walk through now the specific areas of, uh, of a research article. Uh, the background section, uh, th let me start by saying that um, an original research article is a very structured formula. It's like uh, certain forms of poetry. Uh, if you follow the format uh, explicitly, uh, readers have a much easier time uh, picking out the key messages. So the background section usually no more than a page or page and a half double spaced is sufficient, but it should state clearly the research question, why the research question is important, and the hypothesis that the study will test. Uh, the background uh, to the research question, obviously the intro paragraph uh, should, should really tee up why the research question uh, is important, what's already known to some extent in a limited way. Uh, much more about what is known about the research question can be in the discussion section, but you really want to frame this for the reader. Uh, next slide. Uh, the uh, next section of every research paper is the methods section, and I highly recommend a, a single paragraph overview at the very beginning of a methods section that essentially lays out uh, the, 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 what was done uh, the, the sort of general statement of the data that are going to be used, the sample, uh, the instruments, and the um, uh, way that you're going to answer the research question. Sometimes that can actually be included in the last paragraph of the background, uh, but if it's not, you know, sort of generally clear there what sample and data source are going to be, uh, putting that overview at the beginning can really help for, uh, orient the, the reader. The analysis section should always come at the end of the methods section. So which statistical tests were done in what order 
uh, was the, where the calculations performed, uh, that, that paragraph should, should come at the very end of the methods section. In the middle, between the overview and the analysis, are other components as they're needed. And so the, the, the order is typically instruments and their development. So if you develop a survey, you would describe how the survey was developed. Or if you are measuring something using a set of existing measures, what those measures were and what they, how they originated. The study sample, uh, what, uh, what is the study sample that is going to be used to analyze the, uh, the question? Uh, if it's an intervention study, a description of what that intervention was and in enough detail that it could be replicated uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, by others uh, performing the, that uh, intervention. Uh, and then finally, a description of the collection procedures for data. How were the data collected? Uh, what's known about the validity and reliability of the data? Uh, those are also important. Uh, let me go uh, to the next slide. Uh, the next section is on results, and the um, uh, results section should be relatively brief, and it should include only the results. It's occasionally we find that uh, methods are described in the results section. Uh, uh, people feel the need to restate how a model was constructed. Uh, if you've done that in the, uh, in the methods section, it really doesn't have to be repeated in the results section. The results section should only include results. It should also follow the same sequence that you described in the analysis section. So if you do some descriptive statistics first, then you prevent, present some bivariate results, then you prevent a logistic res, uh, present a logistic regression result, that sequence should be described in the analysis section uh, in exactly the same uh, sequence. Uh, highlight only the most important numbers in the text. And here again, I want to emphasize the use of tables and figures for uh, most of the numbers that are going to appear in the paper. Uh, it's much easier to read a uh, description of what's in a table with the table that the author then, or sorry, the reader then able to look at the table uh, and see the numbers and comparisons uh, in the table format than to try to read the numbers in the text itself. Uh, key numbers should obviously be reported, but not all the numbers, and certainly not all the numbers that appear in a table. Uh, let's go to the next uh, section. Uh, the discussion section uh, is um, uh, the final part of the paper, and um, uh, the challenge, I think, in writing a good discussion section for all of us, and I include myself as an author, is to really boil down to six or seven paragraphs uh, the uh, implications that uh, flow from the results. Uh, one way to approach this is to use a very strict format uh, of for each paragraph. So paragraph one often will summarize key results that have already appeared in the results section, but just sort of to say, this is, these, are the, these are the really key uh, numbers uh, and relationships that we've discovered. The second paragraph then can explain the relevance of those results uh, in relationship to uh, the original research question, might talk about what are some of the potential mediators that, uh, for example, tie some set of predictors to some set of outcomes uh, in that type of paper. Or if it's an intervention study, how, how it appeared that the intervention had its effect. The third paragraph can then compare and contrast the results with prior published literature. And um, this is an important, this is the area where prior research is often cited, uh, the uh, results of those prior studies and how uh, results are either confirming or disconfirming or, or distinct from those prior uh, published results. Uh, for the International Journal, we have this additional, um, and this doesn't necessarily have to be a paragraph, but it's good if it is, is to discuss why this study is relevant to readers from other countries. Why is this something that uh, a reader halfway around the world uh, should be interested in? Is it, you know, what's the relevance uh, outside of the policy context of the country where the study was done? Or if it's a multi-country uh, stu multi study, an international comparison study, what does that comparison reveal about uh, the, the particular area of knowledge? Uh, finally, a limitation section. I think, um, uh, there are different styles regarding limitations. Some people like to state a limitation and then talk about why their paper has overcome the limitation. That's one style. 
I tend to think that the style that just states all the limitations is uh, easier to read, uh, clearer, and uh, at the end of the day, it's going to be up to the reader to judge how those limitations might affect uh, the, uh, uh, the, the interpretation. And then finally, a summary and conclusion. Really what uh, a discussion section is meant to do is frame this for the reader and help them understand uh, what you found, uh, why it's relevant, and uh, what it tells us about prior knowledge, and ultimately um, to give the reader a sense of how sure you are, how certain are the results. So that's a research article. Um, I see that there's a question on qualitative uh, research articles, uh, and I'll just address that now. Uh, and uh, the question yep. specifically was, uh, um, for qualitative hey, articles, is it preferable to put quotes in boxes or throughout the article? Uh, for the journal, uh, we uh, actually either style would be acceptable. Uh, the um, uh, quotations, if they cluster naturally around a topic area, a box can be a useful mechanism for uh, calling out quotations. If they are um, illustrating a point in the narrative, uh, I guess I would keep them embedded in uh, in the text of the article. Um, hopefully, that's a helpful. Eric. Answer. Eric. Yes. Yes, we have like seven, eight questions in the queue. Oh, so okay. If maybe if you would like to make like a, an end to your presentation and then we we'll start changing questions. Sure. So uh, actually, I'm pretty close to the uh, pretty close to the end now. Why don't we go to questions now? And and if we have time, we'll uh, uh, well, all I was going to talk about at this point was the quality and practice format, the review article format. Again, that information is available on the uh, instructions to authors. So uh, if we go forward two slides, we'll actually be at the Q&A. OK. Well, one question talks about the, it's a neutral question. What is the time frame between submission, notification, and if accepted, publication? Right. So I'll, I'll talk about uh, some of the ideal time frames. And uh, uh, to those of you who are authors who may have been submitting papers in the past year, um, uh, the, we haven't kept to what I consider the ideal time frames, uh, but we are, uh, we've made changes and, and we expect that we will be on uh, timelines going forward. And these are our expectations. Uh, typically, we are hoping to uh, initial, do that initial screening of a paper within two weeks of its arrival uh, to, the, uh, to the journal. Uh, that can range from two to four weeks, depending on the uh, volume of papers that's coming in and the the uh, um, uh, density of the papers. Uh, at that point, uh, the papers that will move forward, uh, well, the papers that we are not uh, going to pursue, we'll send notice back to the author, uh, thanking the author. Uh, and um, uh, in some instances, not always, but we try to give some uh, information about why or you know, the reason for our decision at that point. But we try to turn those around quickly. The next stage is the review stage, and um, it's approximately ideal, under ideal circumstances, about 45 uh, to 60 days uh, from submission to completion of the reviews. And one of the challenges uh, and is to get the reviews, get a sufficient number of reviews and have the reviewers respond on time. Uh, so uh, ideally, it's 60 days. It can sometimes stretch beyond the 60-day time frame. Uh, before we have the reviews back. And, uh, and then at that point, uh, within 60 to 90 days, ideally, we're responding uh, to the uh, initial submission with uh, uh, judgment uh, based on the reviews. Uh, papers that we um, then, if we're looking for a, re a revision and resubmission, uh, we typically allow a couple of months uh, for that revision resubmission, if it's going to be, if we would like to publish the paper sooner, we'll actually put that request in. Uh, and then uh, revisions, we uh, it's very dependent on whether we need to send the paper back to reviewers. Sometimes reviewers will ask specifically, or the editor feels that they need the reviewer to to uh, weigh in on whether a uh, paper has uh, been sufficiently responsive uh, to the reviews. Uh, so. Uh, it's hard to answer in terms of the ideal timeline. Uh, we occasionally have papers coming back from authors uh, three to four months later. Sometimes revisions, uh, we, they take longer than we want. 
And uh, we're also sensitive uh, uh, on the back end to the publication schedule. Occasionally a paper could be accepted but might not appear in print uh, for some months, although once it's accepted, uh, the electronic version is usually made available uh, earlier. Hope that's helpful. Well, then I have two questions from the same person that says, one, um, if we are interested in papers using consensus development methods such as Delphi and nominal group technique, and the same person asks, how many review articles are published per year? Yeah, so good, good questions. Uh, I would say we will publish around six to eight review articles in a typical year. Um, and in answer to the review article question, we actually uh, are very interested in review articles. Uh, the, um, uh, in particular, systematic reviews that have been rigorously done. I think we would publish more review articles. It's just a matter of kind of how many we receive. Uh, so, but we're very keenly interested in review articles. On the first question regarding uh, consensus me consensus methods, uh, I'm I guess I'm. Uh, understanding that as a question about whether we are interested in papers that study the consensus, me consensus methods directly, and the answer to that would be yes. Uh, we're very interested in um, advances in those consensus methods, uh, their application, um, but uh, I think one of the challenges will be novelty since quite a bit is known about consensus methodologies. They've been around for a long time. Um, Papers that use those techniques to uh, advance healthcare quality measurement or prioritization are also of interest to us. If that, if the question was actually that other uh, uh, version. Well, then we have another question from someone that mentions that does healthcare research related to marginalized populations, such as drug users seems relevant to a broader audience in terms of healthcare quality, such as frequency and reasons for these populations accessing healthcare services which are not drug related? Yes, uh, so those are uh, terrific questions. And yes, we're very interested in research on um, uh, marginalized populations or minority populations. Uh, we're especially interested in uh, uh, papers that address policies related to marginal or minority populations, uh, and, and that can include a broad range of characteristics that uh, uh, differ uh, from country to country. Uh, I should probably also mention that we're quite interested in papers uh, from uh, areas that are not traditionally represented in the research literature or from countries uh, where there is not a large scientific base, so uh, low and middle income countries. Uh, in particular, uh, we, the, the uh, journal has a, a high interest, and ISQA also has a, an interest in trying to advance uh, science about and knowledge about uh, the experience of healthcare in low and middle income countries. And, and for special populations, I'll just add. Well, then we have another question mentioned asking if. If you could explain what you meant when you refer to ethical practices in terms of the writing of a paper. Yeah, and that has to do with uh, authorship uh, primarily uh, and assuring that uh, people who have made a contribution to a paper are appropriately recognized as authors uh, and conversely that people who have not really contributed to a paper uh, are, uh, are not named as authors. Uh, I mentioned earlier the uh, ICMJE, uh, the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, uh, which has a set of guidelines uh, on the web uh, that uh, ad address the issue of authorship and participation in studies, um, the payment of incentives, or the or the uh, uh, you know the other topic area of interest under the ethics of publication is the degree to which conflicts of interest may exist, either financial. Uh, or particularly financial conflicts of interest and funding sources. So uh, when I was referring to the ethics of uh, publication, I really was, at, uh, uh, from the scientific perspective, I was referring to uh, both the accurate reflection of uh, contributions to a paper and the uh, potential for financial conflicts of interest. 
both of, all of which should be disclosed uh, in accord with the ICMJE uh, uh, standards. Two, two more questions, Eric. One is how, how do you you publish an article that looks at findings based on a lot of experience in the field using examples from studies you have previously you have previously done. This paper gives you a perspective, hypothesis, and conclusion. No research was conducted. Yeah, that's, that's a that's an interesting question. I think the uh, answer would be a perspective piece. Uh, that's a that's a not uncommon. Uh, for someone in a perspective to summarize in a cumulative way uh, their own research or the research of themselves and other investigators in an area uh, and to, to advance the knowledge by um, providing that perspective without describing the results, certainly could refer to the papers, cite the papers, uh, summarize the results, but, but it, it's a way of uh, uh, not uh, in a systematic review sense, but in a uh, um, uh, as almost an opinion piece, really, uh, an informed opinion or expert opinion piece. That's what the perspective uh, in quality is, is really designed to do. Great. And, and the last question that was posted, and it's very good for to be the last one itself, is what advice do you have for young writers who have little experience with the process of publishing? Uh, with the process of publishing, so uh, there are a couple of ways to approach the the uh, um, the, the uh, authorship uh, conundrum. Um, one is obviously to read journals and un, you know reflect on uh, what works well in papers that are clear and seem very uh, well communicated. Uh, I actually carry around in my head. A few papers that are really, I mean, I consider them among the best written papers that I've read, and I will even go back to those papers and look at how an author accomplished a particular task. So uh, one example is a paper that describes, it was published in JAMA probably in the mid-1990s, describing a, uh, uh, a method for assessing, using distance as an instrument, an instrumental variables approach to analyze the uh, uh, outcomes of uh, heart attack, and um, the method, the the policy, and the and the result, the methods and the results are interesting. But what was especially interesting to me is that the authors were able to convey a very complicated methodology in a very clear way. And so I think going to papers like that uh, and and finding looking at how the author used language can be very helpful. Uh, the second is to uh, write with a senior author. Find someone uh, who's a senior author who can participate and give feedback on your writing uh, as a co-author. Uh, uh, mentorship is a really important part of the writing process. Uh, the editor can and reviewers can play that role, but, but actually before you even submit the paper, it's good to have that sort of input. And then the, the third activity I rec highly recommend is to serve as a reviewer. Uh, reviewing papers uh, and thinking critically about how a paper is written is a great way to gain knowledge and, and experience. And it's often the case that at the time you submit your review and then there's a response made to the, to the authors, you will see what other reviewers have said about the paper. And that actually turns out to be a great way. I, I still learn and have insights from that when I review a paper and see how others uh, review the paper. Uh, that, that can be a, a real source of information. Uh, I think all those activities can make us better authors. Well, Eric, uh, no more questions were posted. Uh, we have maybe like two more minutes to end. Would you like to make any final comments? Well, I just want to thank everyone who's joined. Uh, it's uh, uh, d always challenging to uh, uh, communicate to an audience you can't see or hear. Uh, so uh, if uh, people are able to come to Geneva, uh, I'll, I'll be giving a session similar to this one, uh, perhaps in more detail, and happy to, to uh, uh, meet people there uh, and take questions. Uh, certainly, I, I appreciate ISCO Knowledge Portal making this information available widely. I encourage participants to, uh, to share it uh, widely as well. And, and Ezekiel, thank you so much for moderating. Thank, thanks you, Eric. It's been a pleasure and a privilege. I hope that for everyone has been as good as a good experience for us. 
and we hope to keep in touch for the next ISCO Knowledge Activity that will be hosted next July the 5th by David Bates, where we will discuss which are the research, the research questions that should be addressed and will surely become papers that Eric will be surely review in the future. <laughs> Thank you very much to all and have a good night and a good morning in the part of the world you're, you're now. Bye-bye. Thank you, Zico.